All right, folks, Mr. Roosh here, and today we're talking about community ecology or the study of how species interact in an area. There are five types of interactions in a community that I want you to know. And the first one is called predation. Number two is competition. Number three is parasitism. Number four is commensalism. And number five is mutualism. These bottom three could be classified in a category of their own, and we call that category symbiotic relationships. And what a symbiotic relationship is, it's a long-term interaction or long-term relationship between two different species. We'll talk more about that in just a second, but let's get into predation. So predation is uh, an interaction between two species where one organism is consuming another organism. So here we would see this lynx uh, chasing down a snowshoe hare, and this would be an act of predation. This lynx is going to capture the snowshoe hare and consume it if it doesn't get away. Now, predation uh, doesn't always have to involve a predator that has these big, grandiose uh, predator adaptations like fangs or claws. Um, technically, this would be considered predation itself, this little sparrow consuming a caterpillar. Um, we could even look at this technically being predation with predators on the hunt, as these monkeys are sifting through each other's fur looking for uh, insects. Um, a subcategory of predation is called herbivory. And what herbivory is, uh, it's one organism consuming vegetation. So this is still uh, a type of predation, but it's just when one organism consumes plants. When we look at predator and prey, there's this tight relationship between the two. Uh, predators have to capture and consume their prey. They have to kill another organism. And if they can't do that, they're going to die off. On the other hand, prey have to avoid the predator at all costs. And they can't, if they can't do that, then they will die off. So there's this paradigm. And it makes this tight relationship between the two. And what happens is you start to see uh, each species develops different adaptations that help them do those two different jobs better and better. So if we look at predator adaptations, a predator adaptation is anything that helps the predator detect, capture, or consume their prey. If we're looking at this rattlesnake, one, it could be its color. It'll help it blend into some soil. It could be the ability to unhinge its jaw to consume larger organisms. Or it could be its fangs and the ability to inject the venom into its prey. If we look at this uh, porcupine, uh, predator, I'm sorry, prey adaptations would be anything that helps the prey escape, avoid, or ward off predators. An obvious prey, prey adaptation would be its spines. Um, not a lot of predators are gonna wanna try to eat this porcupine because they might risk getting hurt from its, uh, from its spines. So let's take a closer look at some predator adaptations. Uh, a common one that you're always, almost always going to see on predators are the placement of their eyes. Their eyes are almost always going to be more towards the front because this helps them focus in on their one target, their one meal that they're looking for. Sometimes predators adapt the ability to uh, blend into their environments, such as camouflage. If you can see the owl blending into the to these trees. Predators also sometimes develop the ability to have better gripping abilities. Uh, for instance, in this eagle, it has the ability to, uh, its talons are very sharp to capture the prey. Or it could be the ability to attract its prey. Uh, in this case, the uh, Venus flytrap will secrete a nectar or a sweet sugary substance for the insects to come eat. And when they land on the Venus flytrap, it's going to consume them. It's going to trap them and eat them. If we look at prey adaptations, um, again, we'll see eye placement, but this time it'll be different. Instead of the eyes being more towards the front, the eyes are gonna be more off to the side. And this will help give the prey uh, a more 360 view of its environment, so it can detect predators coming from different angles. Um, some adaptations will overlap. So we'll see camouflage in both predator and prey. In this case, this is a peppered moth blending into the bark of a tree using camouflage. Sometimes prey will use bright colors to indicate that they're toxic. For instance, this frog will have uh, a toxin that's on its skin. If a predator t comes in contact with that toxin, it could uh, be very detrimental. And sometimes there's even mimicry, where in this case we'll have the king snake. Uh, the king snake looks very similar to the poisonous coral snake. Now predators are going to leave both of them alone because they don't want to risk consuming the wrong snake. If they accidentally consume a coral snake, then they could risk becoming very, very sick. So this is called mimicry uh, when one organism 
uh, appears like another species. The second interaction is called competition, and there's two types of competition. Um, number one, there's interspecific competition, which is when two different species compete for the same resource. And then there's intraspecific competition, where that's competition between members of the same species. Typically, intraspecific competition, uh, that could be you know, two individuals fighting for a mate. And what's going to happen is uh, the stronger of the two will have a better living ability. The weaker is going to have a, a little bit harder time living in the area and has a less likely chance of being able to survive and reproduce. When we look at interspecific competition, this is generally a competition between two different species for the same resource or for the same niche. They're both trying to occupy the same job in the environment. And that brings us to what's called the competitive exclusion principle. Simply what this states is when two species are competing for the same job, for the same niche, that means one will die off. Okay? So a prime example is the red squirrel versus the gray squirrel. The red squirrel was native to England and then the gray squirrel was native to the Americas. Well, some travelers brought the gray squirrel over and what had happened uh, was they both competed for the same natural resource. They both competed for the same food source and the same niche. And what ended up happening was the gray squirrel over time outcompeted the red squirrel. So if you look at this graph, we have the population of the red squirrel and the population of the gray squirrel. Over time, the gray squirrel was much more efficient at gathering resources and reproducing, and its population increased. Since there was less resources for the red squirrel, their population decreased. So what the competitive exclusion principle states, if two species try to occupy the same niche, one will become extinct uh, unless they find another resource. Okay? If they both compete for the same job, one will win and one will lose. And that brings us to what's called uh, resource partitioning. Sometimes species will divide resources or di create territories to prevent competition because they know if there's continual competition, one species will die off. Well, to prevent that and to make sure there's a happily ever after, sometimes organisms will make divisions and say, hey, if you stay on your turf, I'll stay on mine. And there's no competition. And this is a way of avoiding that conflict. And this brings us to the third <clears throat> category of uh, interactions in a community. And this is symbiotic relationships. Uh, here we're going to talk about parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. Now what's the difference between these three and the other two? Well simply this is a long-term relationship between two different species. So let's take a look at parasitism first. This is interaction number three. In parasitism, one species is going to benefit at the expense of the other one. So one species benefits, the other one suffers. Uh, in this bottom example, we have a dog uh, who has an infestation of fleas. And in parasitism, we have to be able to identify these two types of organisms. One's the parasite, and number two is the host. The parasite is always going to be the one that benefits, and in this case, it's going to be the flea. And the host is going to be the dog, the one that suffers. So how does the, how does the flea benefit in this situation? Well, the flea... He's going to get a warm, comfy, uh, comfy home and a fresh meal every single day. Now the host, on the other hand, this dog is going to be a nuisance by this. He's going to be itching and uh, at a discomfort. So in parasitism, one species benefits and the other species suffers. In this case, the flea is benefiting and the dog is suffering. <clears throat> uh, interaction number four is commensalism. And in commensalism, one species benefits and the other is neither harmed or benefited. So here's a prime example. We'll see this in the ocean a lot where we will have uh, a larger fish, in this case the shark, and some smaller fish decide to tag along. And what's going to happen is uh, the smaller fish, they're going to benefit because they're going to get protection or maybe even uh, get some scraps of food. However, that's not going to affect the shark really. The shark isn't going to benefit or be harmed. Another great example would be uh, the case of cattle and cattle egrets. Egrets are these little birds, and what they do is they roam around the cattle, and as the cattle eat the grass, they're actually going to sift through that soil on the grass a little bit, and it's going to cause other insects to run away. And as those in insects uh, come out from hiding, uh, they're going to be visible to the egrets to eat them for food. 
So in this relationship, the egrets are getting a meal out of this and the cattle, they're actually not benefiting or being harmed by this whatsoever. This brings us to the last uh, interaction in a community, which is mutualism. And in mutualism, both species benefit. They're BFFs, good friends. So two prime examples would one be a clownfish and the anemone. And one of my favorites would be a goby and a shrimp. So what's going to happen in this relationship here is the shrimp is actually going to create a little burrow uh, and create a little home for the goby to live in. And the shrimp is actually going to carry out you know, a uh, little bit of cleaning here and there, take debris out of the home, and the goby is going to get a place to live. Now, how does the shrimp benefit from this? Well, shrimp uh, don't have a very good eyesight, so he's actually going to use the goby as a sense of safety and direction. So as long as the shrimp knows that he's next to the goby, he knows that he's away from predators and he's in a safe environment. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, you should be able to tell me the five interactions in a community, and you should think, what was the first one that we went over? Number one was predation. And that's one organism consuming another one. What was the second interaction in a community? That was competition, or when two organisms are fighting for the same resource. Uh, interaction number three was parasitism. Uh, in these relationships, you should be able to tell me who is benefiting and who is not benefiting. In parasitism, the parasite benefits and the host suffers. Interaction number four is commensalism. One species benefits, the other is neither harmed nor benefited. And interaction number five is mutualism. Both species benefit. And you should be able to tell me uh, which of these interactions fall under symbiotic relationships. In this case, it'll be the bottom three, parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. That was species interactions, and I hope that was helpful.